Hi everybody, this is Kelly Ritchie, one of the dietitians here at Avita in Ontario, and welcome to our online recorded classes for the bariatric program here at Avita Health System. Class one is all about carbohydrates and fluids. However, we are going to start off by talking about the different treatment options or the different surgery types that we are most known for here at Avita Health System. So the first surgery type we'll talk about is going to be the sleeve gastrectomy. This is a restrictive procedure, meaning we are shrinking the size of the stomach. The GI or gastrointestinal tract is not changed. We are not rerouting anything there. We are just shrinking the size of the stomach. Some of these patients will have some intolerance or change in tolerance to sugary foods. Specifically, it can trigger something called dumping syndrome or something that kind of makes our gastric system or our stomach empty faster. Um, we talk about dumping syndrome more. It is more common in our bypass patients. However, sleeve patients can have it as well. The remnant stomach is removed, which is a little bit easier to see on our slide on the next page. And the common problem foods tend to be these doughy or sticky carbohydrates, things that absorb a lot of water. They tend to kind of ball up in the stomach. They can sit really heavy. Um, some people don't necessarily have nausea or vomiting, but they might have upset tummy or just feel like there's a rock sitting in their stomach. With meats, you really want to watch out for those tough or dry meats. So if you overcook chicken, let's say it gets really stringy, it gets really tough, it's not very moist or soft anymore, those tend to be harder to tolerate after bariatric surgery. And also fibrous fruits and vegetables, things like apples and celery, where they have a lot of fiber or insoluble fiber on the outside or running through them in the case of celery with the ribs. Fiber is something that is not digested and therefore if you get a lot of it, it's not chewed up very well, it can be challenging to tolerate as well. So this is a picture of what's going on. We have a sleeve shape after the surgery is complete. It is kind of the size and the shape of a banana. So some people might refer to this as the banana surgery. Uh, dumping syndrome is less common with this surgery type because that pylorus there that's marked is still intact. We don't mess with that. We don't bypass it like we do in the other surgery type. That pylorus is a you know, just a muscle that slowly opens and closes. It's a circular muscle, and as it opens, it allows food to move move slowly through. It closes back up, so not all of the food can come through at once as easily. The resected stomach or the portion on the right-hand side is removed through one of your incision sites. If it stays in, it can continue to produce a stomach acid, and since it's all sealed off by itself, it doesn't have anywhere to release it, and therefore is not very good for us, so we take that out before that happens. So with the sleeve surgery, how much weight loss can you expect or what is kind of the general estimated weight loss here? Um, so with the sleeve patients, you're basically, we're looking at about 60 to 70% of your excess body weight. So that would be on top of, or excess is I guess considered what is extra or is not a part of your ideal body weight that is based off of your height. So if you want to go online and check out your ideal body weight, there are different charts that you can use. It'll usually ask you for your for your sex and then it'll ask you for your height and it will give you your ideal body weight. From there, whatever your current weight is, subtract that from the ideal body weight. That is your excess. So sleeve patients lose about 60 to 70 percent of that weight. Um, this can take 18 months, it can take a couple of years. Some patients will actually continue to lose weight into years two and three, just depending upon how fast they lose it or how much weight there is for them to lose. So that's just kind of giving you a general, like we said, what's the typical weight loss that can be expected and how fast is it going to happen. So the other surgery type that's also very common here at Avita is going to be the bypass surgery or what we might hear called the Ruin Y or the gastric bypass. All of those are the same surgery type. This tends to give us more weight loss and it helps promote weight loss two different ways. We are still shrinking the size of the stomach and actually the stomach will be smaller after this surgery type than the sleeve and a portion of the small intestine is bypassed. So the first five feet of your small intestine, which is about the first third of the total length is going to be bypassed or food is no longer going to be moving through that system. Dumping syndrome is a very common side, side effect. This will be current, blah, blah. This will be gone over in detail a little bit later. And the common problem foods are the same. The only ones that we have added are sugar and sugary liquids like juices, sodas, ice creams, and sauces. Just because, like we said, without that, that sphincter or without that pylorus, 
the dumping syndrome is more common, which is usually triggered by sugary foods. So that's why they're added, but the doughy carbs are still there, the meats are still there, the fibrous fruits and vegetables are still there. So fun time, picture time. So this is going to show you before and after. So on the right hand side, we have the smaller gastric pouch. We also have the jejunum there, which is the, the part that has the red arrows running through it. So that's showing us where the food is moving. The bypass portion of the stomach stays in. It still produces really good gastric juices. It also meets up later with um, the bile duct. So we don't want to necessarily seal off the duodenum. We just have it attached later. So that way those gastric juices, as well as those other digestive enzymes are getting down in there and mixing with the food items that we're consuming. So once again, just a little bit different picture here. Like we said, the GI tract is altered with this and we are shrinking the size of the stomach still. This is considered the gold standard when we're looking at bari bariatric surgery. So what are we looking at when it comes to the amount of food you can tolerate post-op? Right now, your stomach pre-op can hold about four to eight cups of fluid and food at one time. That is roughly the size of a two liter bottle or a football. Um, it is a very stretchy, elastic organ. It will try to make space if it can. Immediately after bariatric surgery, you're looking closer to a shot glass size, about a quarter cup to half of a cup at a time. Measuring cups are very helpful during the stages after bariatric surgery. And long term, once the inflammation goes away, there is a little bit of natural stretching that will occur. Like I said, the stomach is a very elastic organ. Um, it is about one to one and a half cups or about a size of a soda can or about the size of your fist. That's usually what's gonna fit pretty comfortably. So expected weight loss with this is gonna be about 70 to 80% of that excess body weight and still the same kind of time frame, about 18 months, maybe even into years two and three, you might still see weight loss after the bariatric surgery is complete or the weight loss surgery is complete. So once again, just gives you a time frame. You do, like I said, usually see more weight loss with the bypass surgery. So this sometimes is a good option for those individuals. We also tend to see better results or decreases in um, not better results, but we usually see better managed diabetes after the surgery type compared to the sleeve. Um, and you usually see decrease or complete, um, complete getting rid of GERD or gastric reflux. So that's the different surgery types. If you have more questions, I would encourage you to reach out to the bariatric clinic rather than the nutrition or the dietitians, just because they'll probably be able to give you more information and based off of some of your past medical history, they might be able to help direct you in the right way, hopefully meeting with Dr. Karras or meeting with her nurse practitioner, they already kind of given you an idea of what the better surgery type for you, you and your goals and your, like I said, your past medical history, which one will fit, fit, fit better with you. So the next part here is about carbohydrates and sugars. So carbohydrates, these are one of our macronutrients. They provide your body with energy or calories. So you get four calories per gram when it comes to carbohydrates. Um, protein is also a macronutrient. You get four calories per gram from there. And then fats is the last macro that gives you nine calories per gram. We go over protein in class two and then we'll hit on fats in class three. About 50% of your calories can come from carbohydrates. So based off of your calorie goals, that will impact how many grams of carbohydrate we might recommend for you. Um, I've seen people go lower than 50%. It's not like you have to fit, hit 50, but 50 is a good starting range to kind of shoot for when it comes to a well-balanced diet. All carbohydrates break down into glucose, so whether they come from complex carbohydrates or simple or refined carbohydrates, eventually they will make their way into glucose. And glucose is the primary energy source for the body. Your nervous system almost relies exclusively on glucose. It doesn't like to compromise. It doesn't like to run off of anything else. So it doesn't like to run off of protein-based molecules. It doesn't like to run off of fat-based molecules like ketones. So you really want to make sure you're giving your body enough energy or glucose to you know, keep those systems functioning. If you don't consume adequate carbohydrates, your body will try to make glucose out of necessity just for those reasons above. Some people can feel really tired or lethargic if they don't get enough carbohydrates in their diet. So we mentioned there's a couple different types of carbohydrates. You heard me mention complex and you heard me mention simple or refined carbohydrates. So complex carbs are gonna typically be these items here on the left-hand side. We're gonna see a lot of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, some different 
like we said, different grains there. So oatmeal maybe, or even some whole grain pastas on there. You'll see some beans and lentils and other plant-based products there. So lots of colors for the most part, like I said, lots of fruits and vegetables on there too. We tend to encourage complex carbs because they will be overall more nutritious for us compared to let's say the simple carbohydrates, which are pictured there on the right. So when I say the word refined, I tend to think of the the items on the left-hand side. They're not in really sweet per se, uh, but they're still simple. There's not a lot of fiber associated with them. We don't typically get as many vitamins and minerals from these items. So things like white breads, white pastas compared to the whole wheat or the whole grain options tend to, we tend to want to decrease. On the right hand side and in the middle there, even with that sugar sweetened beverage, these are things that we kind of think of or as sweets. And so these ones I tend to correlate more so with the simple carbohydrates, but overall, whether it's sweet or savory, since they are refined, since they are processed, they are broken down very, very quickly. So we don't tend to prefer those as much. So here's kind of a written list of, list of the complex carbs. Like we said, whole grains, oatmeal, whole grain breads, whole grain tortillas, whole grain cereals. When you are buying whole grain or whole wheat products, you want to see the word whole. Um, because if it just says wheat, they can actually still really process those. They don't really have a whole lot of fiber associated with them. A lot of the times they're a little bit darker in color just because they've added the color. It's not even naturally there. So like we said, when you're buying your grains, make sure they say whole grain or whole wheat on them. Check the ingredient list, check for that fiber. Those are good things to look for. Brown rice, wild rice are usually less processed than like the white rice, the bazaar basmati rices. Um, quinoa is also a nice option there. Fruits, um, vegetables like plant proteins like legumes and lentils and starchy vegetables like potatoes, corn, squash, and peas. Those tend to have more carb combo blah, blah tend to have more carbohydrates. Your non-starchy vegetables, which is basically any vegetable that's not on a starchy vegetable, so broccoli, carrots, cauliflower, green beans, all of those cabbage would be considered non-starchy. They have some carbohydrate, but very, very small amounts compared to the starchy vegetables. The couple items here that are circled are some of those products that we talked about that are some of those common problem foods for some of our post-op patients. So when you try or incorporate these foods in post-op, definitely kind of listen to your body, see how it handles them, make sure you chew it up really well, all those things. Simple carbohydrates, like we said, these tend to be the sweet things. A lot of these might be more natural than others in the sense of honey compared to let's say cane sugar. However, your body doesn't really notify or really make a difference if it's coming from honey versus cane sugar. At the end of the day, it's sugar. Your body breaks it down really quickly into glucose and it can spike blood sugars and a couple other things too. So a simple carbohydrate, sometimes they will use other things to sweeten prepackaged products that are not maybe sugar or what we would say traditional sugar. They might use things like maple syrup or molasses, high fructose corn syrup's really popular, fructose corn syrup, fruit juice concentrates. All of these can be used to simple or to sweeten a product and it won't necessarily maybe lead you to believe that there is sugar. So go ahead and check up take a peek at the nutrition facts panel in the total sugars area. You want to usually keep that less than 10 grams. So that does include the added sugars in the total. So go ahead and just take a peek at the total sugars. If you see the added sugars are really high, just realize that it's not coming from as much of a natural source. Um, if you see high added sugars, then you're usually going to see a high total sugar, but we prefer you to look at the total sugars. So why avoid these simple carbohydrates, the sweets, the refined carbs, because they are digested faster by the body, which leaves you feeling hungry sooner. We tend to overeat on these food items. We might not feel very full so we can fit more. And even once we become full, we have, it doesn't stay with us as long. So then we can eat sooner. They are more associated with empty calories. So empty just meaning less nutritious. So less vitamins, less minerals, less fiber, less other micronutrients or phytochemicals has a more dramatic effect on your blood sugar. Excess consumption can increase your triglycerides. Um, it can also lead to heart disease and excess weight, having too many simple carbohydrates in the body, and it can lead to dumping syndrome. So what is dumping syndrome? 
This occurs with our bypass or our Roux-en-Y patients mostly. As mentioned before, it's due to bypassing that pyloric sphincter, um, but it can occur in sleeve patients as well. Basically what is happening is the sugary food leaves the stomach too quickly. It moves into the intestinal tract too fast. And when it moves like that, it tends to pull a lot of water in, meaning that it, there's water that is pulled into the intestinal tract when that happens, it can cause a lot of cramping, a lot of pain. Some of our patients also feel things like fast heart rate, sweating, nausea, diarrhea, or vomiting. So a lot of the times it kind of feels like food poisoning due to the type of symptoms that you have. So this is not very fun. You definitely wanna to try to avoid this if you can. Um, and like we said, sugar is one of the culprits for this. Also drinking with meals can cause it because we're adding water to the system already. And in the case of the bypass surgery, not having that sphincter to control the flow, it really does move through faster. So you wanna usually wait about a half an hour after meals to start drinking. Um, like we said, you wanna try to limit the amount of sugar and watch out for symptoms like weakness, dizziness, flushed, cramping, pain, nausea, diarrhea, and sweating. Those are gonna be your cues that you're not tolerating the food item you had very well. So with dumping syndrome, once it begins, there's really nothing you can do to stop it. The best thing that you can do is lay down. That will try to decrease some of the symptoms that you're having, and especially if you're feeling weak or dizzy, we don't really want you to try to get up and move around. Laying down is a really good option in this case. So preventing dumping syndrome, limit sugar and sugar alcohols to less than 10 grams per meal or snack, combine carbohydrate foods with a protein source. This is really interesting, but protein stays in our stomach longer. It takes longer to digest. So when you have carbohydrate foods and you add a protein source, they take longer to break down. They won't leave your stomach as quickly. Sugar substitutes may be used in place of sugar to help avoid dumping syndrome. So if you are comfortable with using stevia or if you're comfortable with using sucralose, which is Splenda or some of those other non-nutritive sweeteners, you are welcome to do so. Um, they are considered safe at this point in time by the FDA. So we allow our patients to utilize them if they feel comfortable with it. Once again, don't drink with meals. Wait that 30 minutes after a meal to begin drinking. Eating small frequent meals, sometimes when you overstuff your pouch after surgery, it can cause a lot of nausea and sometimes vomiting, unfortunately, because it's trying to make space. It just doesn't feel like it can hold all of that food and in some cases liquid at one time. Eat slowly, take that 20 to 30 minutes per meal or snack to eat. Um, so chew your food well, set your fork down between bites, set a timer use an app, whatever you need to do to start slowing down is what we recommend. And stop when you begin to feel full, not once you feel stuffed. After bariatric surgery, the, the margin, the line between feeling full and feeling stuffed is very, tr very hard. Um, some of our patients say one bite can just set you over the edge, you feel perfectly fine, and now all of a sudden you're uncomfortable, you're having the cramping, you're having the nausea, you're having the vomiting, and it's not very fun. So try to listen to your body as much as you can. Using something like the hunger scale can be helpful. We want you to try to stay in the green and the yellow as much as possible. The orange, the dark orange, and the red, it's not a good place to sit because usually when we get into the starving area, the red zone, we tend to then eat to the point where we're maybe in the orange or the dark orange or the red because we it's been so long since we've eaten. We feel very hungry, we feel ravenous, we wanna eat. Um, and sometimes when that happens, we eat very quickly and we don't give our body enough time to give us a fullness cue. So once again, slowing down, taking that 20 to 30 minutes gives your body time to respond and keep you more so in the full to satisfied range rather than getting into these more uncomfortable areas. So we wanted to put some slides in here that show the amount of sugar in some different products that are out there. Some of these are gonna be more obvious than others, but I don't think some people realize how much sugar is in some of these foods. So I think that it can be really fun to go through. So starting off with soda, soda is a culprit of a sugar sweetened beverage in our, in our food system, 39 grams for a can, 65 grams for the bottle. And if you have a two liter, that's about 108 grams of sugar. So that is a lot. If you're looking at the sugar cubes there, that is 39 grams, 65 grams, and 108 grams, what it looks like if you were just to eat sugar cubes. And I know that I would probably get, my tummy would probably get upset 
after the first couple sugar cubes, but when it's in a liquid like pop or if it's in a liquid like some, some of these other products, it's really easy to drink that sugar and it doesn't really tend to upset your stomach because liquid does not stay in your stomach as long as food does. So vitamin waters, they do make sugar-free versions of these, so just be mindful when you're buying which one. Rockstar, some of the other energy drinks are probably going to use sugar to sweeten as well. Be mindful, some of those are carbonated, and we usually don't want patients drinking carbonated beverages after surgery. Also, you're supposed to avoid caffeine for a certain amount of time, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, teas, especially if they're sweet teas or iced teas, they tend to have sugar in them. You can usually find diet varieties that will usually use a sugar substitute instead. Juice. Um, juice a lot of people perceive as being healthy coming from a fruit, but fruit does have natural sugars. A lot of patients ask, is it okay to do the 100% fruit juice, no added sugar? That does not make it sugar-free, so definitely be careful. You might be able to do a couple ounces at a time and keep it less than 10 grams of sugar, but your best bet is gonna be to switch to a diet juice instead, something that's similar to what's pictured up here. One gram of sugar for a whole eight ounces. Candy, candy's hard after bariatric surgery. A lot of us have issues with stopping after a small portion of candy. So if candy kind of calls your name, you know that it's hard to kind of control portions with. Maybe not the best thing to keep around. So two Reese cups has 20 grams of sugar. So even one Reese cup in that package would still be 10 grams, which you want to try to keep it less than 10 grams, especially if you're sugar sensitive. So maybe looking at the miniatures might be a better option. If you're okay with stopping at about one to two of those, that would keep your your sugar less than 10 grams for that for that snack that's not including if you have anything else with the candy and then there are sugar-free options but they do use sugar alcohols in those so you still want to keep those less than 10 grams and we'll talk a little bit more about what sugar alcohols are a little in about 10 10 slides or so so bars, a lot of our patients like to use bars. They're really convenient. You can travel with them and you can find good bars that have a decent amount of protein but aren't too high in sugar. So these are not examples of those bars. We have a Cliff Bar here with 21 grams of sugar. This is kind of geared towards athletes and trying to give them quick energy as well as sustained energy. So if you're looking at Cliff Bars, just try to look at maybe the smaller bars. They might be less than 10 grams, but there are definitely, like I said, other protein bars out there that might be better options. The Nutrigrain Bar, same idea here. If you did half of the bar, you could do that. You could crumble that on a Greek yogurt, get some good protein that way. But those granola type bars or breakfast bars don't typically have a good source of protein in them. So keep that in mind. Um, like we said, a better substitute would be to find a protein bar with at least or about 10 grams of protein or more um, and keeping that sugar less than 10 grams per serving. Um, condiments like ketchup can have sugar added. So one tablespoon of ketchup is four grams of sugar. Um, so you can use two tablespoons that would keep you at eight grams, but keep in mind the rest of the foods on your plate. It can be really easy to get over 10 grams when adding sauces and condiments if you're not careful. You can find other tomato products like no sugar added ketchup that would probably give you a really good similar flavor without nearly as much sugar. So feel free to try other brands. Just make sure you check for the sugar. And that's always on that nutrition panel, so that total sugar like we talked about earlier. Pasta sauces, these will usually have between 7 to 10 grams of sugar depending upon the brand. They do make no sugar added pasta sauces as well, so that might not be a bad option. Or like we said, just watching portion sizing and what, what else is on your plate. You can definitely make this work after surgery. Barbecue sauces, lots of good flavored barbecue sauces out there. The ones that say honey barbecue sauce even just seeing the word honey, you should realize that this is probably going to be higher in sugar than let's say a traditional barbecue sauce. So honey is a natural sugar. It is going to give it some sweetness. It is going to add sugar to the nutrition facts panel. So perhaps looking for a other type of barbecue sauce instead. So like we said, feel free to try other brands as well. Just check for the sugar content. Fruit, dried fruit like raisins, it's it's sugar dense. It is hard to fit into the diet after bariatric surgery if you are very sensitive to sugar. Um, that little box of raisins, that's the traditional box. It's not the super mini box either. That's 30 grams of sugar. And like we said, this is perceived as healthy being a fruit product and not that it doesn't give you good fiber, good vitamins, good minerals, but it just also has a lot of sugar 
tacked on to it. So if you can do whole pieces of fruit instead or things that are not dehydrated, you're gonna be able to get more volume because the water helps kind of dilute that sugar. So when looking at fruit, if it's a piece of fruit, you're usually looking at a half of a piece or a half of a cup at one time. That will help you keep less than 10 grams of sugar. If buying canned, look for what's packed in juice and then try to rinse that juice off prior to consumption. That's really gonna help keep those sugars lower and still you can get the vitamins and minerals and the fiber that that fruit is known for. When it comes to, like we said, pieces of fruit, try to go for a half of a piece. So if we followed that rule here with the example, we would have six grams of sugar for half of a cup of sliced peaches, and we would have about seven and a half for the half of a peach. Berries are kind of the exception to the rule here. You can usually do one cup of berries and keep it lower than 10 grams of sugar. So the strawberries here, one cup of them is seven grams of sugar. So blueberries are included here, raspberries are included here. Um, cherries, however, I believe are not. They tend to be a little bit higher, so try to keep those to half of a cup if you like them. So that kind of wraps up the sugar slides there. One quick note with sugar alcohols, we mentioned these with the sugar-free products. These are man-made, the sugar alcohols are. Um, they are usually used in commercial foods and diet products. They have a very similar flavor to table sugar. They don't usually have as much of an aftertaste. So people do tend to like these, but unfortunately they do cause some GI issues. A lot of patients, and even those that haven't had bariatric surgery, they, they experience bloating, diarrhea, gas, if they're not careful with how much or how many they have. For our bariatric patients, they can cause dumping syndrome still, so 10 grams or less when it comes to sugar alcohols. Um, sugar alcohols have, have half the calories of regular sugar, like I said, that's why they're usually found in diet products. Um, the names, they usually end with that OL sound, so xylitol, zorbitol, mannitol, alcohol, so look for the OL. At the end of the day, sugar plus sugar alcohol should be kept less to, than 10 grams total. So with this example here, there's four grams of sugar, three grams of sugar alcohols, so that's seven. So you could have this product and it shouldn't bother you, um, but everybody's so different. We do have patients that have told us that six grams of sugar and they start to feel nauseated or upset stomach. And we have other patients that don't really have issues. So you do have to play it by ear, but at the end of the day, like we said with those those simple carbohydrates or refined carbohydrates, they tend not to be very filling and maybe not as nutritious for us. So we still wanna limit them even if we tolerate them. So that kind of wraps up the carbohydrate, sugars, sugar alcohol section. Keep in mind, like we said, we like those complex carbs. Um, they will be more filling for you and more nutritious overall. Hydration is what we're gonna kind of wrap up here with. So hydration, what is important about hydrating? Water is going to be important. It is going to be essential. It is calorie free. It helps keep your metabolism on track. It helps promote kidney function and gets rid of waste through your urine. Best treatment for fluid retention, unless you have a diagnosis like chronic heart failure or chronic kidney disease, those patients tend to hold on to fluids a little bit more maintains proper muscle tone. It helps kind of fill the fibers in the muscles and it can help relieve constipation, kind of help keep our bowel movements more regular. So we like water, we like staying hydrated. So fluid goals, you need about 32 to 48 fluid ounces for the first two to four weeks, that is your goal. Long term, when you're about a month full stop, we expect you to be hitting that 64 ounces daily. Um, if you can hit 64 ounces before the month, that's great. We want you to stay hydrated because dehydration or not getting enough fluid is the number one reason for readmission after surgery. Um, so the picture there is of IV fluids. That's typically what they're going to give you in order to help you get, get rehydrated. And hopefully once you get rehydrated, you'll feel a little bit better and be able to get more of those liquids in yourself. So how much can you drink at one time after bariatric surgery? There is no restriction. You can drink whatever feels comfortable. However, I will say most people feel more comfortable sipping rather than gulping. So with food items, you do kind of have to watch the portion sizes is about a quarter cup to half of a cup at one time. But for fluids, since they don't stay in the stomach as long, you don't have to monitor those as much. 
how fast will I be able to drink sipping once again? We'll feel more comfortable immediately after surgery. Um, you can usually resume a normal drinking pattern soon after, but once again, chugging will always be discouraged. It adds a lot of air into the pouch. Most people don't feel comfortable doing it. It ends up causing nausea and vomiting, unfortunately, if you are chugging beverages. And we do not endorse the use of straws as they can introduce air into the pouch. So with sipping, please use the you know edge of the cup or find a water bottle that doesn't use a straw system if you can. That will help prevent or reduce the amount of air entering the pouch. When can you drink? Once again, no drinking with meals. Wait 30 minutes after a meal to resume drinking. This allows the contents of your new stomach to drain slowly and properly. Beverages can rush or liquefy the solid contents out of the pouch, which can promote lack of fullness and dumping syndrome, especially in those bypass patients. What can you drink? Any zero sugar, non-carbonated beverages is on the table. Um, looking for low calorie options as well. Desire for warmer cold beverages may intensify or feel more soothing. A lot of our patients tend to go towards maybe the cold. They really like ice cold water rather than it being room temp. Um, I hear that one more frequent, but I have had some patients just say that room temperature is just more soothing. It's easier for them to handle. So keep that in mind if you're feeling nauseated after surgery. Try different temperatures. That might help. So zero calorie or zero sugar non-carbonated beverage. Water, flavored water like the Crystal Lights or Mio's that can be added to beverages. Gatorade or Powerade Zeros are great. Diet juices can be utilized. You can even do uh, fruit-infused water if you have, you know, lemon, lime, oranges, strawberries, even cucumber water. Some people really like the taste of those. So those are all options. Um, you can use sugar-free popsicles to help with hydration, but at the end of the day, they might not get you as far along as we would like. So you're probably going to have to do some liquid beverages to help with that too. So avoiding carbonation, why is that? Often causes discomfort, oftentimes causes pain. We've had patients tell us stories of they had a sip of carbonation and they felt like they you know, it was retching, they had to lay down, they wanted to put some pressure on their stomach. And like we said, and some people don't have any issues with it, there is some research being done to see if carbonated beverage stretch the stomach back out. So for right now, we still recommend avoiding carbonated beverages, even if it's low sugar, even if it's low calorie. Caffeinated beverages, these might cause you to use the restroom more. So caffeine is a diuretic, meaning it makes you use the potty more, it just makes you go pee more. Uh, so for the first two months when we're trying to stay as hydrated as possible, you really want to avoid caffeine. Um, caffeine should never be the primary source of liquid, so you really shouldn't have tea or coffee be your primary source of uh, beverage because of, once again, that diuretic effect. Also, caffeine can be a stomach irritant, so you don't want to kind of make it angry if you've just had bariatric surgery. And alcohol is very interesting. Every program tends to have different recommendations, but what I've been seeing from a nutrition standpoint is they recommend staying away from alcohol for about the first nine months to a year. Um, the reason being is it is absorbed much faster after bariatric surgery, meaning you will feel tipsier sooner. So you definitely want to be in a safe environment if you are going to partake. And just realize that alcohol has calories, and so it can slow down or stop your weight loss. Alcohol also tends to be very addictive in nature in the sense of it is one of those things that after surgery, if you turn to it, it can be a way to kind of cope in a sense. Uh, what we call is, what we might call it in the field is a transition of addiction. So if before surgery you used food as a cope me mechanism, you don't have food to cope anymore, alcohol can become that, that, that new new addiction so do do be very careful and be very you know diligent about really watching out for this there is a increased risk for alcoholism after bariatric surgery they just tend to they correlate with one another signs of dehydration or not getting enough fluid after bariatric surgery or just for anybody sorry about that um, fatigue dry skin dry mouth headaches dark or low urine output so you know try to keep it a nice pale yellow dizziness or fainting, decreased skin turgor, which is pictured there on the right-hand side. If you pinch up on the back of your hand, as an example, if you release that, if it stays tented or it stays elevated like it is on the right-hand side for more than five seconds, that's a sign of dehydration. 
Other signs can be constipation and digestive issues, accelerated heart rate, and things like joint and muscle pain because there's fluid that sits between those fibers and, and joints. And if you don't have enough fluid to continue to keep those on board, it just causes some discomfort. So like we said, staying hydrated, very, very important. Dehydration, number one reason of readmission. So habits to start working on now. You know, you're starting your journey with bariatric surgery. What are some things that would be helpful to go ahead and start doing or looking into? Number one, looking at smaller plates and bowls. So this is an example of how we can kind of trick our brain into being more satisfied even with the smaller portion sizes we're gonna be working on. Um, the dot looks a lot bigger on the right-hand side, even though it's the same size as the one on the left. It just has to do with that smaller, you know, outer edge, or the, in this case, the smaller plate. So it's the same food here pictured on the right and the left. Once again, the right-hand side does tend to look more filling compared to the left. Uh, we would probably feel more satisfied eating that plate, even though it's on the, you know, like we said, it's the same size either way. Portion kits tend to be very helpful. This is a bento box style portion kit. You can find lots of different other options out there. There are lots of weight loss specific ones. There are bariatric specific ones. If you don't have the funds or the ability to look into that, uh, I would recommend just using some good old Tupperware or you know Ziploc bags or things that you can use to pre-portion food items out into. That will help you a, kind of get ready for surgery in the mindset of eating smaller portions, but also stay compliant with the portion sizes afterwards. Taking smaller bites helps you tolerate foods better. It also helps you take your time and you know makes the meal last a little bit longer. So digestion starts on the plate. Take those small bites. Make sure you chew them up really, really well. Baby toddler utensils can be helpful to encourage smaller bites. So if the utensil is smaller, you're going to be forced to take a smaller bite. They tend to be cheaper than the bariatric specific ones, but they do the same job. Apps and tools. Set reminders to eat and drink on your phone if you're not used to eating five to six small, small meals throughout the day. Look at cell phone apps. There are some tracking apps that are out there. There are meal reminder apps which are focused or pictured on the next slide. Um, you can use a different timing system if you don't like the alarm system on your phone. You can use a kitchen timer or something like that on the left hand side. Measuring cups once again are really useful. Um, the, the item underneath the measuring cups, that is actually a light that you can attach to your water bottle. So that light flashes about every 15 minutes or so and it specifically flashes if you haven't drinking or drinking enough. So that helps you get into good habits if you're not used to drinking 64 ounces of fluid throughout the day. The fancy water bottle on the right hand side, that will actually track your water intake. Um, but if you're doing some of the apps like Very Tastic, My Fitness Pal, which is the blue dancing one, or Spark People, you can usually track your fluid intake in there. And meal reminder, just to plug for them real quick, they allow you to set reminders for meals. So like we said, that's an app that can do it, or you can just put alarms on your phone. Very Tastic or Very Atastic, this is really popular with our patients. They seem to really enjoy it. It is more bariatric focused compared to the other weight loss apps that are up here on the screen. All of these apps are free to use. Um, you can go to your Google Play Store or to your um, iTunes, or sorry, <laughs> you can go to your app store to find these. Um, with the tracking apps like Barry Tastic, My Fitness Pal, Spark People, if you plug in what you're eating throughout the day, it will calculate your calories, your carbohydrates, your sugars. It will usually calculate your protein and other things that we're asking you to start kind of keeping track of. And last but not least here, start to introduce some physical activity. The recommendation is 150 to 300 minutes of moderate activity per week. You can divide this into sessions if you need to. So if you can go for a 15 minute walk in the AM and then maybe do a 15 minute bike ride in the PM or whatever other options you have available to yourself for exercise, this will help you meet your goal. Resistance training, this is going to be things that are working those muscles and keeping them nice and strong. About two days a week for 30 minutes is really all you need. You can do body weight exercises, soup cans, resistance bands, weights. You don't necessarily have to go to a gym to get a good resistance training in. Same with cardio. You can absolutely use activities at home. You can use exercise videos or what other, any other activities that are appropriate or you have access to. So introduce slowly, introduce that activity slowly, pick activities that are appropriate. If you have a lot of knee pain, joint pain, back pain, pool, 
um, getting in a pool like swimming, um, getting on a stationary bike or elliptical, that maybe something that's not as high impact would be better for you, but you gotta start somewhere. So every time that you are checked in by a dietitian, we're always gonna be asking you, you know, how's physical activity doing? What are you up to? So goals to work on based off of today's class, take small bites, chew really well, that 20 to 30 times per bite, eat off of smaller plates and bowls, put your fork down between bites, slow down, meals should take about 20 to 30 minutes, limit sugar and sugar alcohols to 10 grams per meal or less, emphasis on the complex carbs, we prefer those like we were saying, and striving for at least 64 ounces or eight cups of sugar-free beverages daily, so those hydrating fluids. If you do like to drink caffeinated beverages, just make sure you're still getting 64 ounces of hydration. Like we said, majority of those need to come from hydrating fluids. So we are going to be doing a online quiz to kind of complement the classes. That will make sure that you have participated in the class, hopefully. Um, that will also give us the opportunity once you complete that quiz, we can go over it with you. We can then get the information that we need so we can chart and that way we can submit you to insurance properly. Um, for majority of our patients, they have to have that supervised weight loss where we're having um, dietitians or providers charting on them. So like we said, you gotta take the quiz. Um, we're gonna hopefully have a link below this video that you can utilize and take that quiz. Um, if you've got questions when it comes to the information, feel free to reach out. We're going to be posting our contact information here at the nutrition clinic. And if you've got questions about staying in compliance with insurance or other more surgery or office related things, you're going to want to call the bariatric clinic specifically and they'll be able to take care of you. We'll be posting their information probably as well. So go ahead, go ahead and take the quiz from here. Um, we want to make sure that we're getting getting everybody through and taken care of and not, you know, missing anybody. So hopefully this online video was helpful and hopefully it wasn't too bad for you. I know they can get really, really long. So just keep that in mind. Um, you can break it up if you need to, but hopefully you thought the information was valuable and hopefully some of it stuck with you. It's going to be a lot of the things that we're looking for at that final that we talked about today. So... Alrighty, we will probably talk to you again here soon. And if not, feel free to reach out if you've got, like we said, questions or any concerns. Have a great rest of your day and good luck with everything.